chemists and welcome to today's episode of Bale's Chemistry. Today we're going to talk about the enthalpy changes in solution. That's AQA specification 1.4 energetics and can appear on paper one and two of your final exams. If you like this video, remember to hit the thumbs up below. So one of the fundamental laws in this topic for us to think about is energy cannot be created or destroyed. And also whilst we're talking about this topic, we're going to use some slightly different terminology. We're going to talk about the chemicals that we use in the reactions as the system. And we're going to talk about all the air and the water and everything else around those chemicals as the surroundings. So we're just going to quickly recap exothermic and endothermic chemical reactions. So with an exothermic reaction, energy transfers from the system out to the surroundings, which means the energy of the surroundings increases, which means we see a decrease in delta H. So delta H is a negative value. And then we can show it with a reaction profile like this, where the reactants start with a higher energy than the finished products. With an endothermic chemical reaction, energy is transferred from the surroundings to the system, so the opposite way around, which means the surroundings decrease in energy, and which means we have an increase in delta H. And we can see the energy profile here is where the reactants start off with a lower amount of energy and finish with a higher amount of energy in their products. So what is this thing we call enthalpy then? Well, enthalpy is a thermodynamic value which is equal to the system's internal energy, which means it's the same as the heat energy which is stored inside the chemicals. We can't actually measure the enthalpy for individual chemicals, but we can measure the enthalpy change during a chemical reaction. So we can think of it a little bit like this. The enthalpy change is equivalent to the enthalpy of the products minus the enthalpy of the reactants. We measure the enthalpy change because we can measure the change in energy of the surroundings during a chemical reaction. So when it comes to measuring the enthalpy change, like I just said, we measure the change in temperature of the surroundings, and then we use this information and reverse it to look at this as the enthalpy change or the energy change caused by the chemicals in the reaction. So when it comes to calculating the enthalpy change, we're going to follow a couple of steps. The first step we're going to do is we're going to work out how much energy was transferred in our chemical reaction. So to do this, we'll take the mass of the what's been heated up, the mass of the surroundings, we'll multiply it by the specific heat capacity, which is 4.18, and then we'll multiply it by the change in temperature, which we measured during a chemical reaction. This can be simplified down to Q equals MC delta T, where Q is always measured in joules. M is the mass in grams of the substance being heated, so it's the mass in grams of the surroundings. C is the specific heat capacity, which is 4.18, and delta T is measured in Kelvin. Now we don't need to convert from degrees Celsius on our thermometers to Kelvin because the increment between one degree Celsius and one degree Kelvin is exactly the same. So now we've calculated energy transfer, we need to convert that into an enthalpy change. Enthalpy changes are for one mole of the reactant. So we need to identify the limiting reagent in the process and then work out the number of moles of that limiting reagent. Once we have that, we can do minus Q divided by N, where N is the number of moles of the limiting reagent, and Q is the energy transfer, which we worked out on the last slide. The minus bit in front of it means that we're flipping around. So before we've measured the energy change in the surroundings, we need to now have the energy change in the system. Let's take a look at this simple example. An excess of zinc is reacted with 25 centimetres cubed of 0.2 molar copper sulfate solution. The temperature started at 23.2 degrees Celsius and went up to 33.2 degrees Celsius. So the first thing we need to do is calculate the energy transferred. To do this, we'll use the equation Q equals MC delta T, and we'll put the numbers in. So here we've got mass of 25 because one centimeter cubed of solution has got a density of one gram per centimeter cubed, which gives us 25 grams. We've got the specific heat capacity of 4.18, and we've multiplied it by delta T, which is 10. So 10 degrees Celsius or 10 Kelvin. We then calculate a value of 1,045 joules. Now we often give energy transfers and enthalpy changes as kilojoules per mole, so we'll just quickly convert that to kilojoules per mole by dividing by a thousand. We now need to work out the moles of our limiting reagent. To do this, we'll use the equation number of moles equals volume divided by a thousand multiplied by concentration. Remember, we're dividing volume by a thousand because we've got volume given here in centimeters cubed. We'll then add in the numbers, so we've got 0.025 multiplied by 0.2 to have a number of moles of 0.005. So that's number of moles of copper sulfate. We know that that's the limiting reagent because in the question it tells us that the zinc is given in excess. The last step for us to do is calculate the enthalpy change. And for the enthalpy change, we'll take the minus Q over N equation we talked about previously. We'll put the numbers in. So we'll have minus 1.045 divided by 0.005 equals minus 209.0 kilojoules per mole. Don't forget to put the units on the end. So there are three steps to make sure you guys get the calculations right. The first step is to calculate the energy change using Q equals MC delta T. 
Remember, the mass uh, is the mass of the surroundings in grams. So in our case, it was the mass of the liquid present in the copper sulfate. In C is 4.18, that's the specific heat capacity of water, and delta T was the temperature change. In our second step, we need to calculate the moles of the limiting reagent. And in our final step, we need to calculate the enthalpy change using minus Q divided by N. I hope you found this video on measuring enthalpy changes in solution useful. If you have, please hit the thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Thank you and have a great day.